Hi everyone, good afternoon or good morning or good evening whenever you're watching this and welcome to our next SI335 video. I just wanted to start out by sharing with you I found something to put in my bookcase which is my cat and so she's just going to be joining us today. She's going to be learning about some algorithm stuff as well and uh, so I just wanted you to meet her because she normally wouldn't come out. She's too shy. So there she is. All right, let's get into it. Where we ended up last time was talking about the shortcomings of doing experiments. And even though we can get a lot of good ideas, uh, one of the big problems is that um, implementations and experiments are really expensive and careful to do. And so that's kind of the point of our formal analysis. So um, a lot of this will be some ideas you're already familiar with, but I want to kind of lay everything out because all of these pieces of the assumptions that we make in doing formal analysis are things that uh, some of those assumptions will change and we should be aware of what they are as we go along. So the first simplification is what are we measuring? So um, this is kind of like, what are we actually measuring? So when we do analysis of like runtime, most of the time, this is kind of what we mean of what's called a primitive operation. So that's, um, here's a kind of a specific definition, which is saying a primitive operation is going to be something that can be formed in a fixed number of steps on any modern architecture. So in other words, it's something that no matter what, if you're running on ARM or, oh, my cat just jumped down. Um, if you're running on ARM or Intel or on a laptop or on a cell phone, that it should take like a constant number of clock cycles. Uh, and what that means is intentionally a little bit vague, but we can like add small integers, we can look up in RAM, we can do a comparison, we can call a function. Um, not the time to run the function, that depends on what the function is, but the time to jump into the function. Um, you know, so a lot of times we think of like a single line, but the reason why this is not the same as a single line is that a single line is like a line of code is kind of meaningless because it depends on the language. Um, for example, in Python, I could make two lists and then put a plus sign between them to like concatenate those two lists. And that's just like a single line, it's just doing a plus. But is that constant time? No, it's not. Because uh, how that really needs to work to concatenate two arrays. Well, you know, if you think about like in terms of low level operations, you know that to concatenate two arrays, you have to copy the second array onto the end of the first array. So just because something is in one line of code, a lot of times we'll try to write things. And most lines of code that we write are really only like one primitive operation. But sometimes it's more than that. And so it's just something to be a little bit aware of. Um, and so this is going to be our idea. The formal, if, if you want to look up, like there's a, something called a RAM. This is not random access memory. This is a, a, what's called a random access machine, which is kind of like uh, you remember the definition of a Turing machine from SI340. And a random access machine is like that formal idea, but instead of having tapes and states and stuff, a random access machine has a, a bank of memory that you can um, jump to any any individual thing, like do load and store type operations. Um, but it's a similarly formal thing. What we're going to do is is be a little bit more vague than that, because remember this class, we're trying to combine the practical skills and, and how to analyze um, code and, and think about things at a high level from data structures with a little bit more of the formality and strictness that you learn from your theory class. Um, and so we're going to kind of uh, surf that line in between, or at least try to. And just to give an idea of this, uh, I want to jump back to to do a specific primitive count analysis for one algorithm. And I'm going to jump back to the linear search algorithm as one potential idea. OK, so here's the linear search algorithm. And we want to formally count what are the number of primitive operations um, for a size n array in the worst case. The first thing we have to think about, we already talked about this, but what is the worst case here? The worst case is going to be that we go through this loop the most number of times, um, and then and, and then we find something at the end. So I think that the worst case is that is going to be that x, the thing that we're searching for, is greater than the largest thing in the array. 
So that's one way of saying that, that the thing we're searching for is off the end of the array. And so that means we're going to have to go through the entire thing and, and finally return not found at the end. So let's think about how many steps that would take. So what we get in total is like 6n plus 9. OK. Now, I did all of that, and the point of it is mostly to say we should never have to do this because there's a couple reasons. First of all, it's a little bit silly. Like, the primitive op operation definition is intentionally vague. Maybe doing this like AI equal equal X, maybe in some architecture that's actually only one clock cycle. And in fact, I think it is only one clock cycle on like Intel architectures, or at least there's only one machine instruction. Um, and but on sometimes it might be more than one. So already the definition of primitive op is kind of vague anyway. And also we don't, th this is all just to say like, why are we using big O anyway? It's because we don't care about those details. You know, whether this is, should be one or two or 10 primitive ops, it's not gonna change the big O complexity. Um, so when we're counting the number of steps, this is really too specific. Really, we wanna just focus on the N part here and say that's what we care about. And so let's go back and think about what are the simplifications we make so we don't have to worry about this level of detail, hopefully ever again. So the way that we get to focus on really just what matters is of course, you know, by using asymptotic notation. So this is like big O, um, but also these other things which are new, big omega and big theta. So just to be clear, this thing is called an omega. I mean, it's a Greek letter. Um, that's the Greek letter of omega, and this is a Greek letter of theta. Here's a few simplification rules. Uh, most of these are kind of obvious, but you could formally prove these from the definition of big O if you wanted, but I think most of you have probably internalized it. Uh, addition is just saying, th th these ones are kind of obvious that if I have two functions and one, and I know the big O of both of them, then when I add them up or multiply them, then it's a big O of the sum or a big O of the multiple. That might seem obvious, but I'll just point out that there is no like exponentiation rule, right? So if, uh, if I have one thing which is f of n and g of n, this is not necessarily the same big O of like big O of f of n to the big O of g of n. Um, so you can't do this kind of simplification with everything like with exponentiation you also can't do it with subtraction um, and that's important so for example if i have uh and why does that make sense you can think of it like for subtraction if i have 5n minus 3n if i did big o then both of these are big o of n i hope you hear my cat meowing in the background she's she's very active right now she's not upset she's not being tortured she has a toy that she's carrying around that she's going to leave somewhere, but she's very excited about her kill. Okay, so if we had something like 5n minus 3n, we obviously can't say, okay, this is big O of n minus big O of n, and therefore it's zero. No, because we can see that 5n minus 3n is 2n, which is still big O of n, it's not zero. Um, so that's why this really only applies to addition and not subtraction. So a lot of things I'm saying you may have internalized already, but we want to think carefully about when can we make these simplifications and when can't we. Um, okay, so big omega and big theta is what I promised. So big omega is just the opposite of big O. So big O is like an upper bound. And big omega is a lower bound. From like your previous classes, you'll know that like n is big O of n but n is also technically big O of n squared. n is also technically big O of n log n because it's an upper bound. And so when you have it tight, when you have both an upper bound and big O relationship and, uh, and the opposite upper bound, so this is the same as saying that T1 is big omega of T2. So when you have that kind of tight thing going both ways, so this is like a tight bound when we have big theta. So actually, most of the time when we've said big O so far, it's actually um, big theta. So for example, binary search, 
the running time in the worst case is big theta of log n. And so is the running time in the best case. So that's saying that that big O of log n is technically just saying that the running time is dominated above by log n. And when we say big theta, that means that not only is that an upper bound on how much it costs times some constant factor, but it actually happens. When we say big theta, the difference is that, um, so with upper bounds, what we're saying is that, well, the running time isn't worse than this. If I say that my sorting algorithm is big O of n squared, that means, technically speaking, that means that my sorting algorithm is not worse than n squared. But if I say that my sorting algorithm is big theta of n squared, that means that it's not worse than n squared, and there are inputs where it actually reaches some n squared. So not only is it not worse than that, it also actually happens. And the, this bottom question is an interesting one. Which of the previous rules apply? All of them. So all of the, it's somewhat counterintuitive, but all of those rules about like mins and maxes and add and um, multiplication, um, those simplification rules that we know about for simplifying big O's, we can do exactly the same simplification rules for big theta and big omega when we want those kind of bounds. So actually in this class, we're usually going to go after big theta bounds, not just big O, because big theta really tells us the right answer. Um, a lot of times in the past, like if you were to say that, uh, I don't know, from data structures, if you were to say that inserting a number into an AVL tree costs big O of n squared time, probably you would have not gotten any credit on that exam to say that because uh, you, know, you want the tightest possible answer. Although it's technically true to say that inserting is big O of n squared, it's not the tightest possible big O um, because inserting is actually big theta of log n time. And so um, where we've kind of informally meant big theta before, now we're gonna be a little bit more explicit about it in this class because we're trying to be a little bit more precise. Okay, so this is what we just talked about. Um, and the thing that I'll say at this point uh, is just a common misconception. It's very easy to mix these things up, but don't, please don't. Um, so worst case does not mean big O, best case does not mean big omega, and average case does not mean big, big theta. So these are just two separate decisions. So what are the worst, best, and average case doing? That's like picking one curve out of the scattered plot. So if you remember, when we looked at the search algorithms, we thought about like running time compared to size. And for something like linear search, there's just like all these dots all over the place that are looking somewhat like this. And so those are just all the experimental running times. Worst case says, okay, I'm gonna pick this one curve that goes through all the highest dots. So that's like a worst case thing. And what is big O is trying to say, I want to understand this line that the actual function for that line might be like what we looked at in our formal primitive count analysis of saying it was, um, I, I don't know, it came up as like six N plus nine or something. And the big O analysis is saying, well, there's some multiple of N, like maybe 10 N where this is, you know, dominated by this nice looking function. So this is, you know, maybe 10 N and that shows that this is big O of 10 times N and therefore it's big O of n. Um, so the, the worst, best, or average case is like taking this scattered zone of what times could have possibly happened and picking one curve. The big O, big theta, and big omega is about understanding that curve. And what that means is that I can ask for like, what's the big omega of the worst case running time? That means a uh, asymptotic lower bound for the worst case running time of an algorithm. I can say, what's the big theta of the worst case running time? In fact, that's what we most often care about is what exactly is the growth rate of the worst case running time of this algorithm? Um, so we are going to talk about all three of these and we're gonna talk about all three of these, but we're mostly gonna focus on most commonly, we will want to have a worst case analysis so that's the kind of like pessimistic or most conservative view. And we would love to have a big theta bound on that um, to say this is exactly how bad this function does in the worst case. 
Okay, so here we want to look at a different difficulty measure. What was the difficulty measure? It's not the thing that we're measuring. It, it's, the, it's the way of organizing the um, possible inputs. So the difficulty measure is kind of how to sort the inputs. Normally, we just look at the input size, but sometimes we can look at a different aspect. And the one that I'm suggesting here is this value m, which is like how close to the beginning of the array is the thing that you're searching for. And what we saw informally is that for two of these algorithms, for linear search and Gallup search, that when m is small, that those algorithms do better. And one of the things that we can do uh, when we pick a different difficulty measure is it can allow us to kind of have a new, more nuanced view or to focus on a different aspect of what makes one algorithm better than another one. Um, so here what's going to end up happening is that we're going to have two variables in the analysis, both m and n. We saw this last week in the problem that you did with like k and n in that, in that example problem. And now so we're going to have m as well as n here. And there's a relationship, which is that um, the thing that we're searching for, the index is always going to be less than or equal to n. OK, so that's the relationship. Now let's think about our three algorithms and how do they do in terms of this different difficulty measure. So first of all, um, linear search. How does that one do? Well, uh, it's a big O. It's actually big theta, um, but I, I'm typing now, so I don't know how to type theta. Uh, it's a big theta of m, right? We know that it's big theta of n, but in fact, we can be more specific now is that the real cost of linear search is exactly how many steps it takes to get to the thing that it's looking for. So that's going to be um, big theta of m. Uh, what about binary search? Well, binary search doesn't depend at all on where the index is that what we're looking for. I mean, the perform the the um, the running of it does. You know, which indexes you're looking at because it has to give the right answer. But we saw that it always takes log n steps, no matter what. It doesn't have anything to do with m. And so these two running times are now incompatible, right? Sometimes m is smaller than log n and Sometimes log n is smaller than m. It really depends on how close to the beginning of the array that thing is. And that's what we saw in practice, is that sometimes linear search is faster. Sometimes, most of the time, in fact, binary search is faster. Uh, but they're a little bit, you can't say which one will be faster off the, from the beginning. But now let's think about Gallup search. In Gallup search, there's two phases. There's the first phase in which it has to repeatedly double to get past um, what it's looking for. So that phase costs big O of log m in order to repeatedly double. And then it does a binary search in whatever is left. But how big is that range that's left? Well, the key is that that range that's left in Gallup search is at most m as well. Because the last jump that you make is going to be about the same or, or less than or equal to the value of m, the index of what you're looking for. So it's really like log m plus log m, which in terms of big O is just big theta of log m itself. And so what this tells us is that when we use this other difficulty measure of the like index of what we're looking for, we see that now, rather than having this nuance of oh, best case, worst case, no. Now, and I'll make all these be thetas, because they should be big thetas, uh, what we can see is that Gallup search is really the best in terms of when we look at this more nuanced view with this other difficulty measure. Because what this tells us is that because m is always less than or equal to n, this kind of gets to quantify exactly why this one is better. And the, the real benefit here as well is to compare linear search and Gallup search for when the thing is close to the beginning of the array. So what we saw before is that, OK, linear search and Gallup search are both best case constant time. And that's true. But we can say even more than that, which is that Gallup search has to take a logarithmic number of steps compared to how close that number is to the beginning of the array. And that's really what's the power or the benefit of that one. And the last thing I'll mention is just that um, the cost measure can also change. So one of the things that, so most of the time so far, the cost function has been like the number of primitive operations, so the number of steps of the algorithm. Uh, that usually doesn't make sense to count it exactly. 
but sometimes we can count a certain kind of operation, like counting the number of comparisons. And so for a binary search, I think it really ends up being close to like log base two event, maybe like the ceiling of log base two event, because you uh, log base two event is not going to be a integer, so you, you have to take the ceiling or the floor. Um, linear search, in the worst case, is really going to compare the thing you're looking for to every element in the array. So that might, be, I think that is like n comparison to the worst case. And Gallup search is interesting. I think it's roughly two times ceiling of log base two event. And if you think about the worst case for Gallup search is like when the thing you're looking for is at the very end, because of these two phases of that algorithm, it means that the number of gallops that you have to do is log n, and then the number of binary search steps you have to do afterwards is another log n. So it's, it's something like that. Um, and so when we count something more specific, like counting the number of comparisons, or we can like, sometimes you're interested in counting the number of memory operations or something like that, uh, it might make sense to be specific. So I'll just write that. It might make sense to be specific when we're counting something specific like comparisons. So I think that there's um, some questions about like, well, do we always need to do big O analysis? Do we always need to forget about the constants? Uh, the answer is no. And usually when we, when we care about those constants is when we're not counting this vaguely defined thing of like steps or primitive operations, which has all those shortcomings of being inconsistent between programming languages or operating systems or architectures. But when we're counting something specific like the number of comparisons of, of numbers, that, that's something that's real that you can really compare, uh, that you can really count, I should say. Um, that'll have a consistent meaning like between operating systems or whatever. Um, and so when you care about some of these other things like memory usage or another thing to measure is like how much, if you're thinking about a network algorithm, like how much does it have to transfer over the network? Those different kinds of cost functions, sometimes we can get a more precise analysis if we care about that for some reason. Okay, so yeah, and that's specifically what I came up with, which is almost the same as what I said. Um, so just in conclusion, there's no concrete way to say which search algorithm is best. They're all um, the best in different times. And just remember that we have these kind of like um, groups of three of different concepts, which are all related to each other, but, but different. Um, worst case is not the same as big O. Uh, and these different aspects of what ways we're going to be thinking about algorithms and problems for the rest of this class.